that if Brexit had, had lost and Remain had won, and the Brexiteers said, we're not accepting the result of that referendum and we're demanding another one. Could you, in all good conscience, say you'd be sitting here saying they have an absolute right to have a second referendum before anything else happens? No, I mean, I... I you wouldn't have done, would no, you? No, I, I wouldn't, but then I do think... But there do you is... accept that the Brexiteers go, well, exactly. So, yeah, so all here's... these people crying okay. for a second referendum, actually, if it had been reversed, would have been the ones saying, absolutely not. Right, but here's the difference. You know... We are, having done Brexit, we're changing our whole situation. I don't think it's unreasonable when you then get to what that practically means. So, mm. you, you know, let's be clear, we all know a lot more about this now. Even I know more about this now than I did three years ago. Right. Once you get to that point, I don't think it's unreasonable to say, let's go back and check whether people want to think... Well, here's a parallel. Let me throw a parallel to you. So when we vote in a general election every four and a half, five years, whatever, outside of exceptional circumstance, we vote, but we, but we vote on manifestos, often which turn out to be a load of old baloney. You know, the stuff, the broken promises, broken pledges, etc. Tuition et fees. People, you know, also, you know, Nick Clegg and his tuition fees and so on. Uh, but what we don't do is say, well, actually, you know, we didn't fully grasp the complexity of this manifesto, and so we're not going to accept the result of general election. What we, we do what, after five years, Well, no, what, no, 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 what we do is this. We allow the result to stand and the government to govern, and if we don't like it, come the next election, we vote them out. And my point about Brexit is, surely we owe it to the British people who voted in gargantuan numbers on this, mm. we owe it to them to enact Brexit and see if it works. Because my worry would be, if we don't do that, and we do slip in some second referendum, and it goes the other way, there will be hell to pay in this country. 17.4 million people will be... Or, you know, millions and millions. We don't know how many would vote yeah. second time round. Many might take the view, why should I bother? But many mm -hmm. people would be enraged. And so this problem wouldn't go away. It wouldn't be resolved by a second referendum. Yeah, but I think they would just demand another one. Yeah, but I think the analogy is that if, if when the government, you know, you elect a government and then it transpires they're not doing things you really mm -hmm. like, you can put them out at the, at the next election. Yes, but, you, but you allow them to govern first. You allow, you, you allow right. them to prove that they can make what they promise work. At the moment, I'm not seeing a situation that allows Brexiteers to drive the train and try and prove this works. Yep. I'm seeing the will of Parliament going against the will of the people. Right, but I think... This is why I say to you, I think you've got to come to a choice. I think it's a, it, your point is completely valid in circumstances as this is the problem with Theresa May's deal, where you're not sure what the future right. holds. Mm. But if you come to a view in Parliament, supposing Parliament decides for a hard Brexit, mm -hmm. then, OK, you've got a hard Brexit. Then, by the way, the negotiation is reasonably straightforward. Do you think Jeremy Corbyn wants to be in Europe or out of Europe? I'm probably not the best person to ask. No, but about you, know, you know the answer. And I'm isn't not... the fact that none of us know the answer to that question rather telling? Um... Is that we've had two and a half years and the leader of the Labour Party still, even on Sunday in an interview, mm. could not articulate or answer that simple question. Look, I think he's probably traditionally a Brexiteer from the left. Right. I mean, you get, you get this... Mm -hmm. some, people, some people from the right want out of Europe because it's a socialist conspiracy and some people from the, the left want out of Europe because it's a capitalist conspiracy. Yeah. But, I mean... You know, look, the reasons, by the way, I, th I think you and I have discussed this before, the reasons why this is important to my view, I think one of the unfortunate things about the whole debate is that we focus on the, the economics, which are very important mm. for sure, because, uh, you know, that's all about jobs and investment and so on. But, you know, the big reasons that we should be debating are about Britain's place in the world, in a world that's going to be dominated not just by America, mm. but by China. Mm. And I think the thing that... I, I think is, is missing from all this is you need some order in the structure of the debate so you come to a clear decision in Parliament, but you also need to raise people's sights and say, you know, in the middle of this century, where are we going to be as Britain, as a country of this size, in a 21st century where you're going to have two, possibly three giants in the world mm -hmm. and where everything depends on what those giants do? And the reason for Europe is basically... Medium-sized countries like Britain, France, Germany and others, unless we're together, we haven't the weight but to, to get our influence in the to world. To be fair, that argument was lost in the referendum. Yeah, people I'm not people sure said what they yeah. wanted was for the UK to be stronger, to take back control of our laws, our yeah. money and our borders. That's how we operate in a new yeah. world. We do independent trade deals okay, with all of these people. I, I understand And that. we're not part of an undemocratic conspiracy 
you know, whether you're from the right or left, yeah. you know, no, an sure. organisation which doesn't sure. seem to necessarily be working in our individual interests. That's absolutely right. But I guess what I'm saying is the question is, in a decision of this magnitude, do you just take a one-off decision and that's it? Or do you take account of what has happened since then in order to think whether you but think... You... I think, the, I think the, the correct thing to do is you, and you, you exact what the public voted for and you go through with Brexit and you see if it works. And if it doesn't work, we always have the ability down the road to reverse it, don't we? We can do that. Yeah, it might be difficult. Very hard. It's oh, very of hard. course, none of this is easy. We know that already. <laughs> but, it's but, hard but actually, enough to get out. But yeah. actually, if we don't, if we don't enact the referendum result, I think there will be hell to pay in this country, and this will then become the dominant thing which divides us for potentially generations. Okay, so I'm, that is a very strong argument. I accept, but there is an alternative argument which is that once people actually see what it means in practice, mm. if you force people to decide what type of Brexit you want, you see what it means in practice, I think it's not unreasonable to say to people, OK, we've got a far clearer idea of what the real choices are. Have a final say, right? You're, you're asking... You're not going back and asking another people, you're asking the British people. But David Cameron, who was in your shoes as the British Prime Minister when this happened, the week before the referendum, it's all on video, you can Google him, he said this is a once-in-a-lifetime vote there won't be a second vote, and this means we leave the European Union, we leave the single market. He spelled it out. And people were under this idea that people didn't know what they were voting for. I remember very clearly, we debated this every day on this show. Yeah, I'm sure. I remember it being pretty clear. And so I think a lot of the 17.4 million thing, do these people think we're just stupid? They feel insulted. They think... They, yeah. they think I, I, it's, it's a bit yeah. like the debate in, with Trump in America. It's like middle Americans go... We knew what we were voting for. We mm. knew what we were getting with Trump. And, by the way, we preferred him to you liberal smart asses. Yeah, no, I, I understand that, but the difference is with President Trump, you've got to, you know, you're, you'll have the opportunity in 2020 to re-elect Right, but what you didn't them. do with Trump was once he won, say, we're not accepting it and, actually, we're just not going to have it, yeah, which no, is the course. analogy I would use. Yeah, but my analogy is, now that you see all the different changes... Look, how many people said it was... How many people really predicted it would be this messy and this difficult? Uh, yeah, well, I... no, but I come back again that if it was the other way around and Brexiteers were trying to overturn the referendum, absolutely everybody on your side screaming uh, for second referendums and so on would be saying the complete opposite. Yeah, but they, by the way, they would be still arguing that, but it's a different when you're actually changing the way the country's going to work. So, you know, when it's not unreasonable to say to people, look, now we, we see what it means in trade terms, in investment terms, in economic terms, Parliament comes to a decision, the British people have the final say. But leave that aside for the moment, because I, I accept, by the way, there's not a majority in Parliament for a, another mm. referendum at the moment. The key question at the moment is how do you bring some order and structure mm. back into and this? Let me throw you another point, though. So I remember when I was editor of The Mirror and you and your team were very determined that The Mirror get behind Britain entering the euro. And I was assured by all of you that if we didn't, it would be a complete disaster financially for this country. And I'm hearing exactly the same rhetoric now about crashing out with no deal and so on. It will be a disaster. To which I say, well, OK, but everyone was wrong about the euro. It turned out to be the best thing we never did. Mm. Could it be that all the brains saying this will be a disaster, that actually if we did crash out, and we had to come together, we had to make it work. We could maybe be sitting here in five years' time, a bit like with the Euro decision, and it may have worked, and that Brexit might actually be a good thing for this country. Can you say with certainty, given what happened with the Euro, that you may not be wrong? Yeah, but the thing with the Euro is the political reasons for joining were very clear, the economic reasons weren't, and that's why, we, in the end, we never put it before people. But you were wrong in your assessment. No, no, I, look, I always, I, I always said about the Euro that there were political reasons for joining, but economically we had to be aligned with Europe and we weren't. But my point is, could you be... I mean, but, many, you know, many could, was... Could, many was look, can I say with certainly but I would, no, I would just that, say, that you were wrong? Would, well, let me, let me ask okay. a specific question. Okay. Many would say, Tony Blair, you were wrong about the Euro, right? You were wrong about Iraq. How do you know you... Well, many people would say that. How do you know you're not wrong about this? And how do you know that... How do you know with certainty that Brexit may not work? I don't. No one can know with certainty. The question is, uh, you've got to look at the, the probabilities and, and the evidence before you. I think if you... Because no deal's different from hard Brexit, by the way. Mm -hmm. I mean, hard Brexit is a deal, it's just a hard Brexit deal. No deal... 
you immediately go out of your trading arrangements that cover 60% of your trade, I think you've got to say there's going to be a problem. Now, how big the problem is, is another matter. But by the way, I, I've never said that you can't do Brexit and sort yourself mm. out eventually. Mm. What I say, and this is my criticism of the hard Brexiteers, is you've got to be frank with people that if you come out of the trading arrangements you've been in for four and a half decades, yeah. you're bound to cause economic pain. Now, how much and over what period of time is another matter. Before we let you go, just want to just pivot to what happened in New Zealand, an uh, appalling attack by what appears to be a right-wing white supremacist. We've seen a lot of attacks by ISIS. We've seen a lot of attacks, rising attacks by... Uh, far-right white supremacists. The common theme is that they're using social media and all this new technology to spread their hate and perhaps be radicalised into their hate. What do you think about this? What is the, what is the answer for top governments to how to tackle what is now a, a global problem on both sides of the political divide? It's one of the things I, I, I work on now. I think the answer is you've got to form an alliance between what I call the open-minded people in the world. And that's whether they're in, within the religion of Christianity, Islam, Judaism, Buddhism, Hinduism. You've got to have a, an alliance against this extremism and say, we're going to root it out wherever it exists. And the first point and place to start, by the way, is in the way young people are educated. Because around the world today, there are millions of young people educated to a closed-minded view of the world, that if you don't think like me, you're, you're my enemy. Mm -hmm. and, what I've actually been suggesting is that just as we have a global agreement now on the environment and we say what happens within our borders can affect what happens outside our borders, we should do the same with education. And we need... This needs is to be... Is that an argument against faith schools? It's an argument that faith schools should not be preaching that only this faith is a valid faith. So whether you're a faith school or a non-faith school, you should all be cultivating an open-minded approach to people who are different. And whether it's... You know, right-wing extremists are targeting Muslims or Islamists that are targeting, you know, whoever. Mm. You've, this is a fundamental problem and it's going to get worse unless we tackle it at its roots. But at its roots is, uh, the root of it is a closed-minded view of the world that says, I think, like, I think and I'm entitled to make you think the same way and if you don't, you're my enemy. Tony Blair, uh, thank you very much for coming in today. Thank we you. appreciate it.